Hello, my name is Tony Hyman. I'm a director of a Max Planck Institute in Dresden in Germany. On the background, you've seen a movie of a C. elegans embryo going into mitosis. And one of the things that strikes one, of course, when one looks at a movie like this, is what the spindle itself has two poles. If you have a pole here, the red, and you have another pole over here. And that's, of course, at the heart of all cell division, because the chromosomes, when they divide, go to these different poles. You have to have two poles in order for the chromosomes to segregate into two masses. So you can ask the question then, why are there two poles? This is a question that's interested biologists for more than 100 years. This is a picture from the work of Bovary, the great 19th century German cytologist. And this is from a book called by E.B. Wilson called The Cell in Development Heredity, where he summarized a lot of this knowledge that was discovered between the turn of, around the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. And Bovary was also fascinated by this problem, where you could see that the spindle always has two poles, and how is this bipolarity set up? What I'd like to talk to you about in this segment of this talk is the construction of a very complex protein complex called a centriol. Over here, you can see that centrioles are quite large on our scale. Okay, so here we had our tubulin molecules and we're making microtubules. And centrioles are, again, another order of magnitude bigger and therefore complex in terms of thinking of their organization. And at least in some systems, it's the way the centriole duplicates which defines the fact that there are two poles of a mitotic spindle. Bovary was also interested in this problem when he stained uh, mitotic spindles with different dyes. He didn't have access to fluorescence in those days, but he was still able to see lots of substructure. And you can see in this particular picture, it was actually taken by Joe Gall from an original microscope slide of Bovary. Uh, you can actually see that he could see this little structure in the middle of the centrosome, which we now know is like to be the centriole. The centriole is in the middle of the centrosome. The centrosome, known as the pericentrular material, surrounds this centriole, which tends to exist as a pair of linked centrioles, which tend to be orthogonal to each other. One of the questions that's always been interesting in that field is, how do centrioles grow? It's fascinating that once per cell cycle, each centriole makes a duplicated daughter centriole. Just like DNA, you also make one copy of each DNA strand, the same for centrioles, and that's therefore interested people very much over the years. And the work of really three people sorted this problem out um, in, in C. elegans embryos at a morphological level, um, Thomas Cedar Reichardt and Eileen O'Toole, two electron microscopists, and Lawrence Pelletier, who's a cell biologist. And they decided to attack this problem in C. elegans embryos. Now, the problems with studying centrioles are the extremely low abundance. There's only about two per cell. If you take ribosomes, there are many thousands of ribosomes per cell. The biochemistry is extremely difficult, and they also change through the cell cycle. So most large complexes so far studied by structure have normally been isolated biochemically, proteasomes or ribosomes. And so how are we going to study the, the, this problem of centriole growth? Well, let's ask a simple question first. What I've done here, and you're going to see this through this talk, is I've outlined the timeline of um, the cell biology of C. elegans on this axis. Okay, and you can see the different events here, and you can see the time on this bottom axis here. So during this process, we can ask the question, when do centrioles duplicate? Now, centrioles are small, and we can't see them by light microscopy. We certainly can't see, well, we can see individual centrioles, but we can't see very easily that there are one or two. And so in order to do this, you really need to use electron microscopy. So then you want to ask the question, during this time, when is it that centrioles actually duplicate. And in order to do that, you need to say, all right, here I am at this time point, x. What I want to do is look at the centrioles by electron microscopy. And that's what we know as correlative light microscopy and electron microscopy. We use light microscopy 
in a living organism to get the timing of the system. And then we have to go by electron microscopy and look at that system and ask, what did the actual centrioles look like? And a way you can do that is by um, using fixation. But we need to be able to fix at certain time points. And we can do that due to a nice little trick in C. elegans, which is the embryos have an eggshell. Now, this eggshell has been beautifully evolved over many millions of years to keep everything out. These embryos exist in soil, as far as we know, um, and they have to be able to resist any outside insults. But, so you can, you can actually penetrate the eggshell with a laser. You can do a laser beam in a very space age experiment. You can shine it on the eggshell and make pop a little hole. So you can do this nice experiment where you can surround the embryo in glutaraldehyde, which is a fixative, and it doesn't go across the eggshell because it's such an amazing structure. Then you pop a hole in the eggshell, the glutaraldehyde goes in and fixes the embryos. Let's look at that in this movie. What you're going to see is the embryo move a little bit. That's when we pop it with a, la a laser, and you'll see it fix. So here it goes. Pop. See, it's fixed. And pop, the other one's fixed. And did you notice how when we fixed it, all the movement stopped? So it's a very quick process fixation. The glutaraldehyde has a very small molecule, goes in, fixes it. Then you can process the embryos for um, electron microscopy um, by serial sectioning. And what that experiment showed is that centrioles are unduplicated about here. And if you look a few minutes later, they've now duplicated. So by metaphase, they've actually duplicated. So that's a very fast process. The centrioles have gone from unduplicated to duplicated. And so we can conclude then that there's a duplication process that happens early on in the cell cycle of C. elegans. But then you can ask the question, well, how do they duplicate? And the technique we were using then, glutaraldehyde fixation, was not good enough to tell us how the centrioles of the cell being made. We were able to see unduplicated centrioles, and we could see these nicely formed centrioles, but we weren't able to pick up the different stages of central duplication. How, how do they form? They're very complex structures, and that's a question we wanted to ask. Now, in order to do that, we had to move to a different kind of technique, which is known as electron tomography. In order to do tomography, we needed to be able to come back and stop the embryos, but we needed to be able to stop them by freezing. So one way that we preserve structures in biology without disturbing their ultrastructure is by freezing. Very fast freezing preserves biological components without disturbing them as much of the ulcer structure as does the fixation. And what you do is you freeze at very high pressure, and then the high pressure prevents the formation of ice crystals, and then you can infiltrate the fixation at very low temperatures, and that's known as high pressure freezing, and that's a way to preserve the ulcer structure of the system. So what we needed was a way where we could freeze the system at a time-resolved way, in a time-resolved manner. And so we came up with a particular way of doing that using little tubes that are used for kidney dialysis. You can suck embryos into them. You can follow the development of the embryos under the microscope, and then you freeze them in the, um, in the high-pressure freezing machine, and then you process them for tomography. Now, the problem was, when we started this experiment, it wasn't um, easy to actually freeze them at a time that one was interested in. So we used a new machine um, developed by Leica, which allowed us to do term resolved tomography. And I'm going to show you this machine in action here. What we've done is we've taken the, the embryos, we've put them into a tube, we found out they're just at the right size and the right stage. We put them into the high pressure freezer, and now we're going to freeze them. So here it goes. We're going to bring our hand in, and we're going to push it in to the freezer, and then poof, now frozen. Okay. So we rapidly freeze the embryos. Now we can take them, and we can process them for tomography. Now the key thing about tomography is that you look at very thick sections, 
So normally in a standard electron microscope, you can look at sort of 50 nanometers, but you can look at 300 nanometer sections and you can get a 3D picture of the way it looked. I won't go into that in detail in this talk. You can find it elsewhere if you're interested, but it's a way of looking at a 3D picture by electron microscopy. So we can look at centrioles at metaphase and we can see how beautifully they look. And you can see over here, for instance, a very nice picture of a centriole with its microtubules around the outside. And then we can see one over here. So what we want to do is look at these in these tomographic sections. And as I mentioned, one of the main tools for a cell biologist to link phenotype to structure is electron tomography. It's a way that we can actually go in and get at high um, structural resolution the way things look in in situ phenotype. So the problem is that we do genetics and we get a phenotype. We want to know how that's changed at the ultra structure level. We generally can't isolate them from the cell and look at them. Rather, we have to look at them in situ. So what I'm going to show you now is an electron tomogram of a two centrosomes and centrioles early on after duplication. So what we're going to do is stepping through the section. You can see we're looking at one centriole with its microtubules. Then we're going to step through further. Then we're going to come to the other centriole pair. They're about a micron apart. And you can see what we've done there in that tomogram. We've reconstructed both the distribution of the microtubules and the centrioles. And you can see there's a duplicated centriole pair at each spindle pole. So then we said, now we're going to go back in high resolution and we're going to try and understand what are the intermediates in making centrioles using our techniques. And what we learned there was quite fascinating. We learned that the initial step in central formation was formation of a central tube. And you can see that here by tomography and a cartoon next to it. This little tube is forming next to this centriole. It doesn't have any microtubules around the outside yet. It's just a naked tube. What happened then next was the tube elongated. So it's a growth of this tube from what's known as the mother centriole. And so that's what we've learned so far is that the centrioles duplicate by they separate into two individual components and then the daughter centrioles grow from the mother centrioles by the elongation of this tube. And then the next stage was very fascinating because we found that the microtubules then associate around the tube. But what we found was that the microtubules, are there are eventually they're going to be nine microtubules all the way around the tube. But in intermediates in central formation, there are fewer microtubules. So in this case, there are seven microtubules. And also they have intermediate lengths. And you can see over here these hooks that we found around the inner tube that seem to define in some way the nineness of the tube. If you look at a number of different centrioles, you can see intermediate products, so that somehow the microtubules are binding to the tube and forming this ninefold symmetry. Here's a cartoon of the process. You can see the tube elongating and the microtubules binding from the outside, growing and forming the microtubules around the outside of the tube. Now, we've made this cartoon with reconstructions, of course, on fixed material. We haven't seen the microtubules growing, but we've we've um, inferred it by looking at many different particular specimens. So what we learned from that is that centriole assembly proceeds through structural intermediates. You have a tube. The tube grows over about eight minutes. Microtubules associate with a tube over about two minutes. And the mother centriole then matures during its process. I, I didn't uh, discuss that um, in the tomograms, but there's a, uh, the, some mother centriole changes slightly during this process. So what was exciting about that discovery was we'd shown that centrioles have what's known as a, almost like a virus-like assembly, where they have structural intermediates you can define by looking at the growth of the centriole itself. But what we want to do next then was to say, now what we want to do is find the genes required for that process. That's the morphology. What is the genetics? What are the genes required for that particular process? And that turned out to be something which was relatively straightforward using our RNAi screen because of the work of my PhD supervisor, John White, and a postdoc in his lab, Kevin O'Connell. 
And to do that, you have to understand a little bit about the biology of a C. elegans embryo. Have a look at the wild type. You see the blue centriole pair, they come in with the sperm. Now, they then separate, and each pole gets one centriole. But the centriole is duplicated, so therefore you have a centriole pair at each pole. Do you see that? The blue centriole, the, the sperm is brought in a centriole pair, it's separated. So you look at each pole, you see that it has one blue centriole from the sperm, and the orange one represents the duplicated centriole that duplicated during the process of preparing a spindle, as I showed you in the early part of the talk. And then you look at the two-cell stage, the same thing happens again. Let's see what happens if you prevent duplication of the centriole. And what happens when you do that is a very interesting phenotype, because the sperm brings in the centriole pair. The RNA interference, for reasons we don't really understand, doesn't work very well in the sperm. So that's unaffected. And then the centrioles separate, and one goes to each pole. It turns out you don't need duplication to form the pole. So if you don't duplicate your centriole, it doesn't affect the mitosis. But the problem comes in the next cell division, because then each cell only inherits one centriole, not two. And now it only makes a monopolar spindle, so-called monopolar spindle. So normally for the bipolar, it just makes a monopolar spindle. And I'm going to show you some movies of that. So here is a centrosome duplicating at the end of, um, of uh, the cell division. And you can see it moving into two different uh, centrosomes. It's duplicated. And at the two cell stage, you have two centrosomes. And you've got the chromosomes. I've shown you there as well. Okay, So that movie has both labeled centrosomes and labeled chromosomes. Now let's see what happens when centrid duplications failed. Well, everything's looking fine at this point. We've made us a, a spindle. It's all divided. But what happens to the spindles at the two-cell stage of these beautiful little half spindles that form okay, without a second pole? Really gorgeous phenotype. I can't stop looking at those. They're just so beautiful. And in fact, what we then did was to go back to our RNAi screen and say how many genes are required for central duplication. You can take the 800 genes required for cell division, you can rescreen them by fluorescence microscopy, and you can look for the ones that have that phenotype. And from that screen, it turned out that we now know there are five genes required for daughter central duplication. So in the end, also quite simple. There's not many proteins required. You would think, wow, that's a complex process. Doesn't that require a lot of genes? But no, it seems like these five, as far as we can tell, seem to be sufficient. Now, the analysis of these genes um, and their detailed ca characterization was published in a, in a number of different labs, and I've illustrated some of the papers over here. And what all of those studies showed was the same thing, is that if you remove the function of any of these genes, you get a monopolar spindle, as I've shown over there in the fluorescence. And if you then do electron microscopy, you then prevent centriole duplication. So that's quite interesting. We've, we've identified a set of genes that we know require for central duplication. But always when you do a study like this, you have the same problem which is, how are the proteins themselves related to the structure of the process? We've done two different experiments now. I showed you the structural experiments, where we've shown how centrioles duplicate. I've shown you the genetics, which shows you how we identify the proteins involved in that process. But how are we going to link the proteins to the structure? What aspect and which proteins are required for which aspect of building this structure? So then we link the two of them together, and that's what's so nice about doing this time-resolved tomography inside the embryo, is we can now go back and look at the mutant phenotypes by tomography and ask, how does that affect the duplication? And when we do that, what we find is the following. Here I've laid out again our timeline of duplication, and also I've put at the top the proteins. And there's a little uh, hierarchy of organization where there are two proteins, spud2 and zyg1, which are required for all the other proteins to go onto the centriole. Now, if you remove SAS6 or SAS5 from the cell, and then you do electron tomography, you find no duplication either. So that suggests that SAS5 and SAS6 are probably required for forming the central tube. But SAS4 was more interesting in its, uh, in its electron microscopy phenotype because when we remove SAS4, 
you still formed a tube, but you don't form any microtubules around the outside of the tube. So that tells us then that SAS4 in some way is required to form the tubes around, the microtubules around the tube. Let me just show you one tomogram of formation of SAS4. In SAS4 RNAi embryos, you can see that the mother is fine, but the daughter only has a tube with no microtubules around it. Okay, can you see that here, that little purple, uh, that the green is the mother and the purple is the daughter. So that's what we conclude then from this study, which is that the uh, set of proteins forms onto the, the forming centriole, and then we can show that SAS5 and SAS6 are apparently required for forming the central tube, and SAS4 is required for forming the microtubules around the outside of the tube. So in that study, what I've tried to show you is another very um, uh, complex, um, uh, uh, intricate protein complex forming from the arrangement of different molecules. It forms an interesting structure, but it's a different one than microtubules. Microtubules are polymers. This one seems to be a more virus-like assembly with steps of assembly process that we can isolate. And we can also find the genes required for it, and we can show in outline how they're required for the different aspects of centriole formation. And the next stage, of course, will be to do more detailed structural work to not try and understand how the individual proteins affect, and are, um, for instance, the formation of the tube itself. So centrioles then, we believe now, form by a sort of virus-like mechanism with steps in the assembly process. And coming back to our uh, um, scale, you can see that we've gone up quite a few orders of magnitude now okay, from our little tubular molecules. So we're actually looking at fairly complex structures, which are a couple of orders of magnitudes bigger than the molecules that make them up. And so you can see that slowly we're putting the cell into subcompartments of organization. We're not working on individual proteins, but they make these very complex structures. Some are the more machine-like, which make, say, ribosomes, which make protein, but other ones are more complex, like polymers, or like centrioles, and by thinking about how these things are put together, it helps us to understand the organization of the cell. And I'd like to thank, finish by just, the course, the genomics itself is a very, very um, uh, uh, um, time-consuming process involving many different people, but some of the key players are mentioned here, as well as those um, involved in, in centriole assembly.